Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for day two of AWS reInvent 2018. We're proud to present our first speaker of the day, Eric Onan with CloudAbility. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. So my name is Eric Onan. I'm the CTO of CloudAbility. If you're not familiar with what we do at CloudAbility, we are a cost visibility management and optimization platform. We work with the largest consumers of public cloud, uh, including some of AWS's largest customers. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a number of things related to containers that we see our customers dealing with in the enterprise. Uh, some struggles in terms of how they adopt containers, a little bit of history around how we got to where we're at, and then we'll do a deep dive into uh, a concept of container cost allocation and what that means and why it's a challenge. So in terms of overall global cloud consumption of public cloud, in general the market is tracking towards a $277 billion number uh, with predominantly growth in IT happening in public cloud as it stands today. And one thing we know for sure is that as the enterprise starts to spend more and more money, that they're adamant that they have better control and visibility over where those dollars are going, who's consuming what in cloud, are they getting a good ROI that they're happy with around that cloud consumption. There's an entire pillar within the well-architected framework for AWS around cost optimization. There's a competency now that exists for resource and cost management. Uh, and the enterprise is paying attention to where the dollars go. That's going to become particularly challenging when containers enter the mix for the enterprise. So if we look at what the technology landscape looked like for containers in 2015, it, it was roughly this. Amazon had launched ECS, so that was really the first sort of vendor-supported managed platform for running a container and operating it. Uh, we had competing orchestration tiers, so we had CoreOS, we had Docker Swarm, uh, we had competing container standards even. So Rocket and Docker were sort of fighting out how do you even conceptualize a container, uh, let alone where do we operate them and run them. Uh, conversely, in 2015, the enterprise was generally not using containers. Uh, there were some early experimentations from our perspective, but really the enterprise didn't know uh, how they were going to factor containers into their workloads, how they're going to deploy them, what they meant, what were the benefits, why would they go down that path. Fast forward to 2017, and the container enterprise landscape is actually a real thing, but it's changed dramatically from what we had in 2015. So Kubernetes is now the de facto go-to standard for container orchestration within the enterprise uh, if you're not using a vendor-hosted platform like ECS. Uh, and we're seeing rapid adoption, at, at least early enterprises, doing CI CD in pretty heavy workloads and containers in the enterprise by the 2017 timeframe. Another lens into this data, uh, the 27, this is from our state of the cloud report from 2018. And effectively, you can see Kubernetes over the course of 2017 overtaking the self-managed framework. And we're seeing uh, a compound growth quarter over quarter of over 226% adoption of container infrastructure, container workloads within the enterprise in, in the 2017 timeframe. Uh, fast forward to today, 2018, and the complexity continues. Now we're having conversations around what is a service mesh? Why do I need a service mesh? Uh, we have competing service meshes. We have Istio. We have Conduit. And Effectively, the, the act of keeping up with what are containers, of staying on top of the technology changes has become incredibly difficult, not just for the enterprise, but pretty much for everybody. So uh, this is an excellent blog post if you haven't read it around. It's basically a full-time job keeping up with changes for Kubernetes right now. We have enterprise customers who are employing people just for the act of trying to understand how they bring containers into their enterprise. Uh, and we have over 30 special interest groups just within the Kubernetes ecosystem uh, in and of itself. So at a high level, the challenges that we see enterprises having, we've already talked about one of them. Uh, there's a lot of complexity of the rate of change keeping up with what is going on in the container ecosystem is one that enterprises struggle with. Uh, we also see challenges with operational excellence. So many enterprises haven't fully enabled DevOps or fully haven't embraced DevOps yet. Uh, so let alone how do they bring in all this complexity around a service mesh, around an orchestration tier. Uh, and then lastly, People want to know what these things cost. And there's a fundamental change in terms of understanding what it costs to operate a container versus, say, a tagged server in cloud compute infrastructure. So uh, on the operational experience side, we've got a lot of competing technologies. We have EKS, we have ECS, uh, we have Fargate, and arguably you could add Lambda and, uh, as of a couple days ago, Firecracker into this mix. And really the enterprise is just kind of trying to get a handle around how do we operate containers and what's the right way for us how does it fit into our processes, et cetera? So to illustrate 
some of the changes uh, that containers bring in terms of cost visibility and understanding what you're actually spending to operate these containers. Uh, this is a report of some of my infrastructure. This is our uh, part of our data lake. And the, the key takeaway here is that the cost for this is pretty flat, right? So we're just operating a lot of large i3 instances. Uh, they're not elastic. We don't scale them up and down because they're constantly working. But it's, it's a pretty clear path for me to know, OK, well, what is it costing me to operate this infrastructure for my data team for this particular service for these workloads? To contrast that, this is uh, a sample of some of our Fargate spend. And there's a couple things to notice. It peaks and drops according to what the elasticity of that workload is. Uh, but also, we've now moved away from having just a single resource cost to three different line items for what it costs to operate a single Fargate container. Uh, we have CPU, we have memory, and we have data transfer costs. Uh, up until very recently, we couldn't tag these costs. So at best, you could look at what your Fargate costs were within a single AWS account. Uh, but that was about as precise as you could get for understanding what it costs to operate a Fargate cluster. Uh, but Fargate's only one example. There's a number of other challenges around understanding what it actually costs us to operate a container. So uh, ECS, for example, understanding, you, you may be operating your own fleet of ECS servers, but understanding what an individual task costs to operate and what consumption, what part of that underlying host it consumed is a completely different story. The APIs really aren't there to make that an easy task at the moment. Uh, on, in Kubernetes land, uh, effectively, there are multiple different models for resource allocation, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more. But universally, regardless of which solution you've chosen to operate your containers, which orchestration tier you've gone with, uh, there's a problem which is effectively what we call variable cost basis for cost sharing. So what do we mean by variable cost basis? Um, one of the reasons this is challenging to understand is you have to understand how reserved instances move throughout your infrastructure. So if we imagine, uh, I picked some simple examples here to keep the math small, but if we imagine three reserved instances for T2 types, we have an all upfront, a partial upfront, and a no upfront, the cost to operate a host that's covered by those RIs hour over hour is different. You save more money if you commit up front with RIs. Most people are pretty familiar with this concept at this point. Um, but because these are ISF or instance size flex RIs, that means they can apply to more than one host. That RI isn't limited to applying to just one server. And if we are run, uh, we bought T2 2XL RIs, but if we imagine that we're running 16 T2 larges, those RIs can actually be split across all 16 of those hosts. And so now we have 16 hosts that all cost us different things to operate. That looks like a pretty clean model, but if you actually look at the way the data works and how our eyes apply, they'll get split up and float around and apply to different hosts across the board. And the fundamental takeaway here is that these are four different hosts covered by four different RIs with four different underlying cost bases. So different dollar amounts to operate each one of these hosts hour over hour. And this data is constantly changing and it's constantly moving throughout your infrastructure with RIs ebbing and flowing and changing and shifting. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. Because on these hosts, sometimes part of them will also be on demand. So you won't necessarily always have a host that's fully covered by an RI. OK, well, what does this have to do with containers? So imagine an orchestration tier where we start with a C4 8XL at time zero. And we deploy four containers, container one, two, three, and four. Each one of those containers is effectively consuming a portion of that underlying host that has up to four different things in this scenario that can contribute to the cost to operate that particular host. So at time 10, we add some capacity to our container infrastructure, to our orchestration tier. We add a 4XL and a 2XL. And those have different RI coverages rates, some on demand. In one case, three different RIs. And our, but then we have a node failure at time 20, and one of those nodes goes away. Our orchestration tier does its job. It moves the containers to different hosts. But by this point, time 20, we have a completely different cost basis for what it costs to operate container one between time zero and time 20. And we've changed twice. The orchestration tier then at time 30 decides to move container one and two to another host. And again, completely different underlying costs for what it means to operate the EC2 hosts that are underneath that Kubernetes infrastructure. So between time 0 and time 10, we've had four changes, four different cost bases, four different RIs apply in mixed ways, and some on-demand costs sprinkled in. So what does this mean for understanding what those containers cost to operate? Well, effectively, we have to do things like follow those RIs, understand the underlying hosts, in some cases, if it's an all or a partial upfront RI, 
amortize that RI over the lifetime of the host, depending on where the RI is hopped around, and then take that dollar amount, and according to an algorithm that we give our customers control over, decide how to allocate that cost back. So one example of how this materializes is if we want to take the unused portion of those hosts and reattribute that back to containers and sort of blend out that rate, we give you the option of doing that. Conversely, if you want to say 25% of this host was not used for containers, we can break that out into a different metric and you can get a sense of what is the underutilized portion of your container cost allocation infrastructure. It can also help you optimize what those blends look like. So are you fitting your containers properly to different workloads? And generally, we're deployment tier and orchestration tier agnostic. Um, and at the end of the day, as an operator, the, the thing that I like the most about the solution is I can start to get an understanding of what does my application cost me to operate. And that application can consist of a lot of different variety. It can consist of some Lambda functions, some containers, some EC2 hosts, some RDS. And we can smooth that up and roll it up into a single unit that we can reason about in terms of this application cost X, and are we happy with the ROI around that? So that's it. We'll be uh, around if you want to discuss some of the details, see a demo, uh, booth 1316, and cloud ability. Thank you.